Let me begin by setting the stage. Um, Sarajevo, several months after the signing of the Dayton Peace Accords that ended the war in Bosnia. Can you all hear me? Loud enough? Uh, departing Serb for forces in a final act of vengeful spite are setting aflame any structures still standing after the four-year-long siege of the Bosnian capital. And this gentleman, Dr. Rupert Neudek, he spends the day with his son Marcel in a residential section of the city, breaking down doors and rushing into burning buildings to save the lives of elderly Muslims. The winter of 1996 is a cold one, and Dr. Neudek is taking yet another holiday with his immediate family in an active war zone. It's his third time there since news first broke about genocidal ethnic cleansing, mass rapes, and the setting up of quote-unquote concentration camps in the Balkans. That evening, the renowned German journalist and humanitarian sits uh, quietly in a Bosnian friend's apartment, reading out of necessity by candlelight, a book about the Wehrmacht's occupation of Poland a half, year, uh, half century earlier. Waking to the sound of explosions early the next day, he looks out the window at all the destruction on the street below, and uh, later recalls, and this is a quote, that was precisely how I imagined early mornings in the Warsaw Ghetto. There were um, olfactory reminders of the past as well, the road that, quote, uh, smelled of genocide near Srebrenica, for instance, or the, quote, treacly foul stench of decaying corpses in Kigali. Yes, Rupert Neudek had also been in Rwanda during the genocidal rampage of 1994, and that was no coincidence. Over the previous decade and a half, he had frequently been among the first German volunteers to arrive in trouble spots across the globe, organizing dozens of humanitarian missions from Southeast Asia to Southeast Europe. Most of this work was done on the, on the side as a shoestring operation of sorts during vacation or on nights and weekends with his wife, Kusta, uh, in their modest town ha house uh, on the outskirts of Cologne. And that was where I visited Rupert Neudek to find out why he had chosen to go to places like Mogadishu instead of Mallorca, which was, of course, the preferred vacation spot for most middle-class Germans. Neudek, and you can see it better in this photo, Neudek cut a, um, a dashing figure with a gaunt, weathered face and a neatly trimmed white beard. At least that's what he looked like when I met him. Um, he had the air of a sea captain, though he was often mistaken for a medical doctor, which was an understandable error given all the medical assistance. <laughs> <clears throat> he had brought to Asia and Africa over the years. Uh, he was, in fact, a doctor of philosophy. Uh, born in Danzig on the eve of World War II, Neudek fled westward with his mother and younger siblings away from the advancing Red Army in the waning months of the war. Uh, he studied law as a young man and served as a Jesuit novice. But then he decided to change course and write a doctoral thesis on the political ethics of the French existential philosophers Sartre and Camus. After completing his degree, Neudek <coughs> took a different career path once again, beginning work in 1977 as a journalist and editor at West Germany's <coughs> premier public radio station. He and his wife, he later told me, were leading a, quote, perfectly Sorry, one more. perfectly bourgeois life at the time. Well, that all changed in February 1979 during a trip he took to Paris to collect material for a new book he was working on on Sartre. And it was there that Neudek met with the renowned French philosopher André uh, Glucksmann here on the, uh, here on the right. Uh, Glucksmann was the first to speak with him at length about the dire situation of the so-called boat people in Southeast Asia. Their plight had just broken as a major news story several months earlier. And um, the way Neudek tells the story is that uh, Glucksmann stood up in, in, the, um, in the cafe, I don't know if it was the same one we were sitting there, but his first words to, to him were, que faites-vous, que faites-vous? What was he, Neudek, personally going to do about the refugees? Neudek had similarly memorable meetings with uh, Sartre himself and also with Bernard Kushner, whom you see here on the left. Uh, Kushner, of course, the future French foreign minister who had founded Doctors Without Borders in 1971. 
But here you see Kushnar board a, a boat called a bateau for the Vietnam, a ship for or a boat for Vietnam, uh, which he had organized to help save boat people in the South China Sea. You see him with some of the uh, young girl. Inspired by these three men, so Glucksmann, uh, Satra, and, and Kushner, Neudeck returned to Germany intent on doing his part to help refugees from the region who were stranded and, and, and dying on the high seas. That decision had a great deal to do with Neudeck's own personal history. Uh, on January 30th, 1945, during their flight from Danzig, he and his family arrived in the Baltic port city of Gotenhafen, where they saw a large uh, cruise ship in the harbor, the Wilhelm Busloff. Uh, originally built in the mid-1930s for the Nazi leisure movement, strength through joy of Kafkaus Freude, uh, the ship was now being used to evacuate German officials, civilians, and, and refugees from the advancing Soviet army. Uh, Neudek's mother didn't have tickets for the Guslov. Uh, he told me she wouldn't have taken a, quote, luxury ship for Nazi bigwigs anyway, and they wound up on board a coal steamer instead. Mm -hmm. That was our savior, he told me. Later that day, a Soviet submarine sank the Guslov and thousands of its passengers drowned in the freezing waters of the Baltic. The news quickly reached him and his family, and horrific images of the disaster left an indelible impression on the, the five-year-old. This was why Neudek believed death by drowning became such an important archetype in his life and a major motivation for his later relief efforts. <clears throat> <clears throat> it used to be worse when I smoked. <laughs> Thanks to a flood of private donations, Neudek was able to charter and outfit a decommissioned Dutch freighter, the Cap on the Moor. And by the summer of 1982, uh, the ship had rescued almost 10,000 boat people, most of whom were later allowed to seek refuge in the Federal Republic. Um, the group became best known at the time for this uh, perilous undertaking, but its activities were not limited to saving the lives of those fleeing by sea. Neudek also sent teams of German doctors and nurses to the Thai-Cambodian border uh, to assist Cambodian refuge refugees who just survived the Khmer Rouge genocide. Uh, here you see him hoisting a sign at uh, the, the camp where his, his volunteers went. And there on the right, Samoda Kushner, there he is aboard the Kappa Namor with uh, some of the young people he had helped to save. <clears throat> you know, some of these young guys, I'll talk more about her later, but uh, there's a German journalist, Aliana Bott, and um, she became very close to one family, and in fact wound up bringing several of, uh, actually that entire family, what was left of it, back to Germany uh, with her. She also was with one of her neighbors, was a forced parent, so. All right, um, their work in the refugee camps relied on the generous support of private citizens and, and, and German celebrities, including the Nobel Prize winning novelist Heinrich Böll. Um, equally essential was the engagement of hundreds of uh, West Germans who volunteered for stints of four to eight weeks. And that included one nurse from Bonn, from the uh, West German capital, who decided to volunteer instead of taking a ski vacation that year. And she later explained that she had worked for five weeks, uh, quote, under the most primitive conditions, part of her words. To be effective, Neudek believed, volunteers had to live together with the people without any showers or, or other niceties. Uh, quote, experiencing hardship and physically sharing their everyday reality is crucial for aid work. And I think one detects here the, the Christian impulse behind this former Jesuit novice's activities and perhaps his scholarly interest in existential philosophy as, as, as well. Um, I had to think of that quote when I was in the archive. I found an East German document uh, written by a diplomat who was complaining because the East Germans had also sent medical personnel directly to Cambodia, and they were being put up in uh, hotels that didn't have any air conditioning. And this was considered a, 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 a tsunut on the front. No, there was much air conditioning. Was there air conditioning? I don't even. I don't think anywhere. But yeah. it's hard. <laughs> a childhood trauma, uh, a Catholic upbringing, and a fortuitous visit to Paris 
in the winter of 1979. These were the three main influences that first spurred Rupert Nydek into action. And when I sat with him decades later in a living room filled to the brim with foreign art and, and, and other artifacts, what we in Brooklyn we used to call tchotchkes, um, that he had collected from abroad over the years, the, the conversation eventually turned to why he and his volunteers did what they did. He told me that you know he suspected they had endless motivations, but there was most certainly a very great collective willingness on the part of his fellow Germans to do, quote, more for humanitarian issues than all other European nationalities. And that, he added, most certainly has to do with the past. But which past exactly? His main motivation, he readily acknowledged, had been his, his own traumatic experiences as a child refugee. But, um, but what about the suffering the Germans had caused and not the suffering they had earlier experienced themselves? Um, Nazi crimes against humanity and against the Jews in particular had played a, quote, powerful role, he thought. And he added that his, activities or, uh, his organization's activities were a, quote, semi-conscious attempt to compensate somehow for this past, to portray Germany, quote, a little bit differently in the world. And when it came to humanitarian actions, he insisted, German volunteers always did more than other Europeans because they didn't want to be surpassed in their efforts. This was, after all, one area where they were, quote, allowed to be on top of the world. Several weeks after meeting with uh, Rupert Neudeck, I spoke with Helmut Schmidt about uh, his government's response to the Cambodian genocide. And the former West German Chancellor had come under attack in the late 1970s for not doing enough to help the refugees in Indochina. He said to me, you know, what happened tens of thousands of miles away in Southeast Asia didn't threaten West Germany in any way, uh, and the genocide in Cambodia, he bluntly told me, quote, didn't concern us. Uh, almost all Asian countries con uh, committed acts that, quote, violated morality, but this was simply not, quote, our affair. And um, it was very interesting the way he said our affair. He used the expression, uh, he said, it's funny, it was a beer. It wasn't our, our beer. I have another, I have several interesting anecdotes from that interview. I'd be glad to share after this interesting the discussion. Well, he continued that the Federal Republic's vital interests came before moral and humanitarian considerations. And in the realm of foreign affairs, those interests consisted almost exclusively at the time of the existential threat posed by Soviet nuclear weapons stationed in Eastern Europe. Uh, Foreign Minister Hans-Dietrich Genscher, you see here on the right, uh, he had a similar take at the time. He was annoyed by repeated requests for information about the Cambodian genocide. He wanted to know why some West German politicians were placing, quote, uh, so much value on this issue anyway. Uh, that was one of those neat documents you find in the art. I mean, what he said was, wasn't neat, but, but you know, finding something like that. If, if, for those who follow German politics, it was um, Hans Jochen uh, Fulman, is that? Yeah, yeah, who an SPD politician who kept on writing and repeatedly asking, you know, what do we know about what's going on there? And he was pretty annoyed by that. Well, whatever reservations the two men may have had, their country would take in almost 14,000 refugees from, from Indochina by the spring of 1980. Here are some, I think, arriving in the airport in Frankfurt. Um, a drop in the bucket, given the number of, of, of refugees, but it was the highest number among Western nations without any special ties to the region, like the United States and, and France. Uh, why? Well, by way of explanation, West German officials pointed to their own country's bitter experiences involving mass flight and expulsion. Uh, as I'm sure most of you know, like Rupert Neudeck and his family, some 12 million ethnic Germans uh, fled or were expelled from Germany's eastern territories in the mid and late 1940s. Another 2.7 million uh, fled communist East Germany between 1949 and 1961, the year that the wall was built. Uh, Foreign Minister Genscher himself had fled the GDR as a young man. That was something he emphasized uh, in you know, behind-the-scenes talks with foreign dignitaries when explaining why Germany was willing to take in these refugees. <clears throat> but 
As the number of refugees skyrocketed worldwide beginning in the late 1970s, and with it the number of people applying for asylum in the Federal Republic, the initial willingness to, to welcome these, these poor souls from for, who were, you know, fleeing war-torn regions, it quickly gave way to angry resentment about foreign frauds who were supposedly taking advantage of German uh, generosity. It seems like if I have a statistic correct in, in my head, the number of asylum seekers in 1979 or 1980 was greater than all the asylum seekers the, the uh, entire decade going going back, or maybe even longer, <coughs> the 60s and 70s. It was a huge jump all of a sudden. Okay, so. In any event, we have here two contrasting responses to one of the world's most horrific genocides since the systematic murder of the European Jews in the 1940s. Copious concern and bountiful largesse, uh, on the one hand, apparent indifference and acrimonious backlash on the other. Responses that, of course, prefigure in many ways developments in today's Federal Republic. Since 2015, the xenophobic far right has enjoyed a, a political resurgence there in the wake of Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel's controversial decision to welcome more than a million refugees from Africa and the Middle East. Now, both developments drew global attention to Germany, but neither the, the Chancellor's largesse or generosity nor the backlash it brought in its wake should have been a surprise, at least not to those familiar with the story of what Germans have talked about and done in response to genocide and other uh, mass suffering in foreign lands since 1945, and that is the subject of my, of my book. Is the speed okay here? Okay, I just want to make sure that, uh, all right, and you can all hear me. There's nothing worse than listening to somebody mumbling through a, through a talk. I can think of few foreign policy issues more vital than the international community's response or lack thereof to state-sponsored mass murder, despite since 1945 the oft-repeated injunction, <laughs> never again. German reactions to genocide are important, I think, because they give us a much better sense of how and why powerful states have decided whether to intervene in humanitarian trouble spots across the globe. And given Germany's own intimate relationship with the so-called crime of crimes, its responses to genocide in foreign lands are, I think, especially intriguing. And just as important, they vividly demonstrate how domestic debates and political interests influence such decisions. Uh, cognitive factors were especially uh, important here, values and beliefs, culture, morals, emotions, all of which, of course, are heavily shaped by historical experience and the perceived lessons of the past. And that was especially true for post-war Germany, where an especially intense culture of remembrance about the Third Reich had been cultivated in its western half since the 1960s and about the Holocaust since the late 1970s. Um, the GDR is, is, is more complex in that respect, and I, I'd be happy to talk a bit about that also during the, the discussion. <clears throat> There are, um, there are few countries more haunted by the darker aspects of their recent history than Germany, as you all know. Uh, almost 80 years after the end of World War II, the bar barbaric crimes committed by the Nazis continue to cast a long shadow um, at home and abroad, coloring perceptions and self-perceptions of the country and its people. Yet, the story of how Germans managed to put their violent, genocidal past behind them in practice and create a stable and prosperous democracy, reluctant to use force and committed to the defense of human rights, that is, I think, an equally important and gripping tale. If the driving, years, uh, if the driving question about the years prior to 1945 had long been a disheartening one, where did Germany go wrong, the period since the war presents a different puzzle. How and why did Germany go right? I don't mean politically. My book never again um, tackles these questions in a roundabout way, using German responses to mass murder in other lands 
to understand how the weight of the past shaped beliefs, beliefs and influenced actual behavior in the post-war present. And I consciously chose this, this indirect approach, German responses to foreign genocides, because I wanted to present a less, a less stilted, a less artificial picture of German memory work. Now, as I'm sure most of you know, there, there are many abstract theories about the nature and significance of collective memory. But to my mind, its true importance lies in its consequences. In other words, in its tangible effects on actual attitudes and actions. And that's why I focus in, in the book less on solemn statements by high-level officials, you know, which is the, the usual approach to German Vergangenheitsbewältigung, uh, or coming to terms with the past, and instead more on the concrete acts that came in response to reports of foreign genocide. Um, to get at these issues, I specifically look at German responses to the three infamous genocides that took place in Cambodia, Bosnia, and Rwanda from the mid-1970s to the mid-1990s. And I want to quickly add a, a, an important disclaimer. The mass slaughter that took place in those three countries were not necessarily the worst post-war genocides. I mean, how do you measure or compare suffering and, and cruelty anyway? But they did receive the most international attention, and that makes the available source material especially rich. The reason I add this is, uh, you know, uh, I'll sometimes get questions or reviews of the book, which will say, you know, what about Guatemala? You know, you know, you know, and all the others I could have looked at. Um, one of the most infuriating criticisms has been, why don't you? Why why doesn't Port talk about the response to the Herrero, uh, the, the Herrero Nama genocide? Which makes me wonder, like maybe they should read the title of the book you know, after. Um, geographic diversity was an equally important consideration. Uh, each took place in a different part of the world, and as a result, Germany's historical and contemporary relationships with each country varied considerably. And that's important because it lets me explore how German responses to foreign genocide were shaped by political, uh, geopolitical, and diplomatic calculations, economic interests, racial and ethnic prejudices, and um, last but not least, historical burdens, including Germany's relatively short-lived legacy of colonial empire. Um, it helps explain, for instance, why Germans did so much to aid Bosnians at the very same time they failed to lift a finger to help the Tutsi in Rwanda. In any event, um, working on the period from the 1970s to the 1990s is significant because it lays bare evolving reactions to mass murder during a period of drastic change, from the height of the Cold War when two German states still existed, to the period following unification, from a time when few Germans showed much interest in the Holocaust to one when few topics generated as much public attention as the genocide of the European Jews. The precise timing of these genocides is also significant. By chance, um, a conspicuous interest in, in um, a conspicuous spike in interest, increase in interest about the European Jews coincided with the genocide in Cambodia. In fact, the Khmer Rouge were driven from power the very month the American uh, miniseries Holocaust uh, aired on West German television in January 1979. So earlier in the month, the Khmer Rouge were overthrown, and then the, the American miniseries is shown later that, that, that month. That sensational media event, the Holocaust miniseries, that initiated a public fixation on the final solution at precisely the point in time when first-hand details about the carnage in Cambodia began to emerge. And it fundamentally influenced German responses to the crimes of the Khmer Rouge. In turn, it affected how Germans spoke and thought about their own past. And that became especially clear during the so-called um, the, the, the infamous historic strike, the, the historian's uh, quarrel, this fierce public debate in the mid-1980s between German conservatives and progressives about the uniqueness and the causes of what now increasingly became known as the Holocaust. Um, the book on the right was edited, it was a collection of, of articles that the two journalists, Bob, the one I had met, and um, 
Tizi Tizi Tizani, thank you. It's, yeah, um, a, a series of the articles that they had uh, collected, including one that she wrote, which was a two-part series for the Spiegel, uh, detailing the history of, of a single Cambodian family. Remember I mentioned her before and said that she brought some back with her? Um, she was on vacation uh, in Cam in the region, I think in Thailand at the time, the Spiegel wrote her, they said, could you go and uh, you know, see what you can find there? And she, she wrote this uh, two-part series. It's, it's, it's really harrowing descriptions. The, at the front of it, you have a, a, a family tree there are almost 90 names on it, and half of them are blacked out. You know, the people who, who were um, who were killed. Anyway, that title itself, Holocaust in Cambodia, I think would have been unimaginable two or three years earlier. Um, I think that, I mean, it's just one very concrete example of how the discourse um, the, the, the discourse changes. Now, remember when I say that two or three years earlier, I once came across on YouTube. Um, a video of Helmut Schmidt's an impromptu speech he held at Auschwitz. He was the first West German Chancellor to visit. Have any of you ever seen this, this speech? You can see it on YouTube. He, um, what I found striking about it is he doesn't mention the Jews at all, not once. Uh, and, and Which would be unimaginable a couple of years. <laughs> um, but he does talk about Hitler's first, first victims, who he said were the Germans, probably to the chagrin of Austrians. All right. There are other good reasons why I began in the 1970s. This was the decade when global interest in human rights reemerged. It was also when the worldwide flow of refugees, as I said before, reached unprecedented proportions. And that was a development that had a major impact on German responses to foreign genocide. It stimulated humanitarian efforts to relieve mass suffering abroad. But it also, at the same time, stoked fears about letting in too many foreigners, especially bogus ones who were supposedly coming to Germany for, for purely venal reasons. Now, few issues have enlivened and politicized public debate of late as much as immigration. And of course, not just in the Federal Republic, as people in my country in the United States are, are well aware. And I, I'm just curious, in Israel, immigration has also occasionally been a topic of, yeah, of, of, My work draws attention to two contradictory impulses then since the 1970s. You know, on the one side, um, rampant fear and anger and resentment about overburdening and what the Germans call it, Überfremdung, excessive foreignization. Uh, and on the other hand, a widespread desire, e even a compulsion for some because of Germany's past, to help the less fortunate. A look at German reactions to genocide during the first half of the 1990s, it, 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 it takes our story into the period after the Cold War, and thus into a much different geopolitical context. Germany's unexpected unification in 1990 not only marked the end of four decades of division, but it also transformed the country's international position. The restoration of full sovereignty meant that the country now had greater freedom for maneuver, as well as greater international responsibilities. And its responses to the twin genocides in Cambodia, uh, in, sorry, in Bosnia or Rwanda, show how this dramatically, these developments dramatically reconfigured the country's foreign policy, as well as its, as its relationship with an increasingly distant past. Um, as I'm sure many of you recall, the Federal Republic's change standing in the world gave rise to a great deal of anguish and hand-wringing at the time. Would, would unified Germany remain a quote-unquote tamed power, or would it revert to its dangerous and destructive ways of yore, and the country truly learn the lessons of its history. Well, the question of what those lessons even were became a great source of X debate in the shadow of, of genocidal atrocities in, in, in the Balkans, where Ger unified Germany faced its most significant challenge abroad since unification. 
whether to participate in joint international military efforts aimed at stopping genocide and other human rights abuses on, on foreign soil. This confronted uh, Germans with difficult choices that threw into disarray the old post-war consensus on foreign policy and the non-use of force. Even renowned pacifists like the man behind me, Joschka Fischer, the former uh, student radical and future foreign minister, came down on the side of quote-unquote humanitarian intervention. Uh, and as foreign minister in the late 1990s, Fischer, of course, would preside over Germany's first actual combat mission abroad since 1945 in, in Kosovo. Uh, at the time, he, when he came to Kosovo, he invoked the specter of genocide uh, and Germany's past. He had already done this four years earlier um, following Srebrenica. He was, um, he was one person I really wanted to interview for the book. Um, if we have time during the q and I, I can tell you a very interesting anecdote about my, uh, something that happened between me and Yoshua Fisher last, last, last spring, but if we have time. All right. My initial interest in German responses to foreign genocide uh, it came in the summer of 1992 when I first heard reports that uh, Serbs had set up concentration camps in Bosnia. And I was living in Germany at the time. I vividly recall television images like this one of, of emaciated men with shaved heads standing behind barbed wire. And the images resonated for obvious reasons. I distinctly recall thinking at the time that this could not be true, that there could not be concentration camps in Europe in 1992. Um, I also recall a great deal of skepticism in Germany as well as policymakers and public figures in the media struggled to come up with a quote unquote uh, proper response. Never again war or never again Auschwitz. And these two slogans encapsulated the harrowing dilemma that many Germans faced. I just want to say, if you give me your email, I'm happy to send okay, you. Sorry. No, not at all. No, but it's it, just no, the but, things that are. Yeah. Okay. No, but I, I can send you the, the slideshow. Okay, it's not you. a problem. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Um, th these two slogans encapsulated the heart, and that way you don't have me in front of it. So that's fine. Again, that, that's my icon on my Facebook. Media. Oh, okay. Um, these two slogans, never again Auschwitz or never again war, they encapsulated the, the harrowing dilemma that many Germans faced after learning about the genocidal atrocities taking place in Bosnia, should their country, because of its past, stand by and do nothing in response to reports of yet another genocide, this time only a day's drive from Berlin, or should they participate in international interventions intended to stop the mass uh, slaughter by the use of force? The story of how Germans confronted their past and the concrete consequences that that had in response to mass atrocities abroad. It's a highly relevant story that is arguably as worthy of our interest as the darker topics in modern German history. Now, please don't misunderstand me. The focus on Nazism and the Holocaust is, is understandable, of course, and it's how, how, how it should be. But the attention my book devotes to the admirable and really often uplifting actions of Germans from all walks of life, it offers countries with difficult pasts, including my own, the United States, a, a master class in coming to terms with the more sinister aspects of their own history. And I mentioned the United States. You know, It's especially important, I think, at a moment when many seem to fear that the United States might go the same way uh, Germany did in the 1930s, and I had a long dinner conversation with my host in Tel Aviv a few days ago, and his concern is that Israel might be going in that, in that, um, in that direction. So I don't judge, I'm just telling you what, he, you know, what he said. Looking to the Germans for inspiration, it reinforces a widespread tendency to see post-war Western Germany as a success story. Now, there are 
good reasons for questioning that simple but uplifting narrative, which downplays the less sanguine aspects of Germany's post-war history, right? Endemic racism and, 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 and sexism, environmental degradation, continuing wealth disparities, etc. Um, still, even with those caveats in mind, and even when not measured against the horrific foil of Nazi Germany, um, and despite what an increasing number of my colleagues who work on post-45 Germany say, um, I think the Federal Republic was indeed a success story. It was a place where Germans effectively put their violent, once genocidal past behind them. And their responses to genocides in foreign lands are an untold aspect of that, of that story. Now, it's true that their responses did not do much to prevent genocide. They were more reactive than, than, than active, even when it was taking place in their own backyard in the Balkans. And despite their obligations as an early signatory of the 1948 UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, but my research doesn't take a, um, a prescriptive or normative approach. It's not a, a, a jacuzzi of Germans for what they should have done in the face of genocide. Have, have, are any of you familiar with uh, Samantha Powers' book, A Problem for Mel? Pell? Is this, is this one? Samantha Powers, who um, she was a young journalist in the early 90s covering Bosnia. In the early 2000s, she wrote this book, A Problem for Mel, which looked at U.S. responses, um, or, or lack thereof, to post-war uh, genocides. And it's a very emotional book. It's, it, it is a, a, a very strong uh, critique, a jacuzzi, if you will, of, of uh, American, American policy. Um, I don't do that. I don't do that. My book explores instead um, the, the parameters of the possible for post-war Germany given the weight of its own past, given the weight of its international position before and after 1989. Hardly anyone, least of all the Germans themselves, would have wished or expected East or West Germany to take military action abroad. Now, that would change dramatically after unification, and that transformation, along with the stormy domestic debates unleashed by the decision to, to intervene militarily in Bosnia, um, those are central themes of, of the book, and of course they remain important themes today, especially since the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and uh, the, the current conflict in, 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 in the Middle East. Um, every time I have presented on this book, even before October 7th, I've received um, usually aggressive questions about Germany's response to to uh, the, tre the treatment of Palestinians. Right? First time this happened was when I was doing something online last spring, and um, the moderator tried not to address the question, kind of, and, and, and I did because I don't like to do that. You know, somebody's asking a polite question, but then he, um, a few days later, I wound up. He, he wrote an article that wound up on a pro-Palestinian website and then a whole bunch of other um, very leftist websites. Um, and it starts like this. I recently had an unusual but pleasant experience. And what was unusual and pleasant was the fact that I actually took the question. But he also quoted me at length, my response, and I sound like an idiot because every other word is, uh, uh, uh. And, and, and that was important for, for a couple of reasons. One, it made me really think through these issues. And in fact, I have written a piece on this. It's called Germany, Genocide in Gaza. And if anyone's interested in reading it, it appeared in Eurozine uh, in March. I'm happy to send you the, the, uh, the link you can. OK, at any rate, this is an important point, the one that no one expected Germans to take military action abroad. Why? because it moves the conversation beyond moralistic condemnations of an action, inaction, beyond the, the, the writing of history is what I like to call politics by other means. Uh, for most countries, grand actions involving military force are extremely difficult or, or simply not possible, and that's why I focus instead on what German officials and ordinary uh, citizens could and did do short of sending combat troops providing various forms of humanitarian assistance, for example, 
um, exerting diplomatic pressure behind the scenes, enforcing economic sanctions, uh, last but not least, welcoming large numbers of refugees to Germany. Um, interestingly enough, in the early 90s, the Germans took in more refugees from former Yugoslavia than all of the other countries of Europe uh, put, put together. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that reports of mass atrocities goaded Germans into action, and what they did went far beyond high-sounding speeches meant to uh, atone for past atrocities. And that's significant because I think it reveals a great deal about German values and mentalities and, and, and lessons learned after 1945. Again, lessons that should be of interest to people in my own country, perhaps in yours as well, uh, the people in, you know, who are searching for effective ways to reckon with the more sordid aspects of their own country's past. What struck me repeatedly about German reactions to foreign genocide is that the, uh, the lessons and the legacy of the Third Reich and the Holocaust were not at all clear-cut. Right? This difficult choice between never again Auschwitz and never again war it captures just how ambivalent the burden of history could be. And in fact, as I show again and again in my book, Germany's violent past was, uh, could be and was used to draw diametrically opposed conclusions about proper responses to reports of foreign genocide. Those who tended to see Germany's hands tied because of its history, because of Nazism, uh, who, who spoke passionately of a duty to nonviolence because of the Third Reich, they met with equally heartfelt counter-arguments by those who pointed to their own country's past as an injunction to act. Um, Foreign Minister Klaus Kinkel, Genscher's successor, he met with uh, German diplomats in uh, late June 1995, so about two weeks before, two weeks before Srebrenica took place. Uh, and he, he said the following, quote, we have a political and moral duty to assist precisely in light of our history. Uh, it was, after all, he continued, the allies who, using military force, by the way, freed us from the Nazi dictatorship. Now, if the Third Reich has taught us anything, it's perhaps that there are no simple answers to these debates. But my book draws attention to something just as important, and that is, the mass suffering caused by Germans was not necessarily the past that mattered most. Um, as Rupert Neudeck, the fellow I began with, as his story teaches us, the suffering the Germans experienced themselves, their often profound sense of victimhood could be equally motivational. And so could perceptions of political and even economic self-interest. In fact, my work shows how these debates about proper responses to genocide were used over and over to score points against domestic political rivals, with progressives accusing conservatives of supporting humanitarian military intervention in hopes of one day restoring Germany's status as a, as a Großmacht or, or great power. Those on the right corresponded, uh, responded in kind asking uh, correctly, I think, why the left had remained so silent as Cambodian communists butchered uh, millions. And I should add, it wasn't just the right who, who said that. Many, many self-critical leftists also raised that issue uh, in the 70s, but also in the 80s. What these debates also show is that most German conservatives confronted and took responsibility for their country's past as seriously as their opponents on the left. And I think that's an important and perhaps often overlooked legacy of the progressive political upheavals of the 1960s when Nazi crimes became, for almost all Germans, regardless of political outlook, the measure of all things evil. Um, the willingness of conservative Germans to countenance their country's difficult past and, and draw important lessons from it um, I think it distinguishes them, uh, I, it, you know, as an American, I keep going back to the American example, but I think it distinguishes them from many counterparts in the United States who seem disinclined to, to confront, much less take responsibility for the history and legacy of American racism. Um, but these conservative responses, I think they serve as a sign of encouragement that such efforts need not be 
uh, politically exclusive or one-sided. And nor should remorse. Nor should remorse. One of the, uh, I interviewed at length several times a CDU politician, he's no longer active, but a fellow named Stefan Schwarz, who came from, um, a, 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 I guess, CDU loyalty. His parents were good friends with Helen Nicole since the late 1940s. They were sometimes vacation together. Um, Stefan Schwarz became one of the most uh, vigorous proponents of, of, of some sort of action in, um, in, in Bosnia. And he told me a great deal to do with his own, with his own, uh, with his own upbringing. All right, there's perhaps another important lesson here for an American and perhaps Israeli audience, you know, what to avoid when confronting the past. And that'll be my final point today, what to avoid. Well, after two decades of deafening silence about the Holocaust, the pendulum swung in the opposite direction, beginning in the 1960s, producing an uh, almost obsessive public preoccupation with the dark side of Germany's history. And that, of course, eventually produced an angry backlash, even on the part of those who can in no way be considered apologists for the Third Reich. And I'm referring to Germans, even on the left, Weizen and others, who uh, complain that the political and moralistic use of, of negative memories about the Nazi past has been used as a um, high-handed moral cudgel against political enemies. Now, my work shows how those very disputes dominated public discussion about genocide in foreign lands, fueling accusations that foreign genocides were somehow being used to relativize Germany's own earlier crimes. And this played out in the very way that language was used, heated debates about the appropriateness of referring to, to Serb prison compounds in Bosnia as concentration camps. That was just one example of this, one that had eerie reverberations in uh, recent, well, no, no, not so recent, about two years ago, debates in the US about the use of that, that charge term to describe holding facilities for immigrants on our, our southern uh, border. And of course, um, most of you are familiar with Masha Gieson's piece in The New Yorker, where she refers to Gaza as a, as a, as a, as a ghetto. Was that, did that get a lot of attention here? Yeah. It didn't. Well, didn't it, it did in the U.S. All right, okay. and Germany. Um, the point is, and I'll end with this. The point is that Americans can indeed learn from the Germans about confronting their own <coughs> checkered past, but those lessons, I think, are ambivalent. Again, the backlash in Germany against too much memory has largely been a defiant response to style and approach to excessive moralizing and finger-pointing to, to the instrumental use of memory to attack one, one's foes across the aisle. The need to achieve a balance between too little and too much to strike a, a proper tone that doesn't give rise to nasty recriminations and, and indignant backlash, that I think is perhaps the most important lesson the Germans can teach us. And I will end there. Thank you.